Ladies and gentlemen, I'll call the uh, regular March meeting of the Board of uh, Aldermen of the Town of Franklin. I want to welcome everyone. It's good to see a big crowd tonight, and I want to welcome the uh, men and women of the Fourth Estate. Good to have you all with us tonight, too. Uh, if you wanted to speak during the public comment period, the sign-up sheet's up there. Uh, and uh, if you would, go ahead and sign up, and uh, we'll get to you in just a minute if anybody has signed up. The first item of business tonight is the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Vice Mayor Berlin Curtis. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we uh, adopt the uh, agenda for tonight, uh, our town manager has a change that she'd like to recommend uh, to the agenda. Madam Manager? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and town board. Yes, I would ask the board if we could remove under new business line item I. It's the waterline easement for Industrial Park Road. Um, so paperwork on the other end has not been completed, so they requested that we move that to the April meeting. All right, all in favor? All right, that being said, uh, will we adopt uh, get a motion to adopt the agenda as presented with one change? All in favor? All right, I'll entertain a motion for the approval of the February the 2nd and the February the 23rd board meetings. Uh, is there a motion to approve? I so move. Second. All in favor? All right, ladies and gentlemen, nobody, no one has signed up for the uh, public session. Uh, so, last call. Might have one last Well, Larry, well, uh, Larry and I talked a minute ago. I think he's going to talk to the agenda item. Yeah, okay. Pass it down. We have uh, two street closing requests for the Arts Council. Madam Manager. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, Town Board. Um, Bobby Cantino with the Arts Council approached and wanted to make her annual request. She's requesting a street closure for the Arts Council. The first one would be Friday, May 22nd from 5.30 p.m. <coughs> until 9 o'clock p.m. for Freedom Rocks the Square, and that would be strictly on Iola Street. And then the second closure would be Friday, October the 2nd, 2015, from 5.30 until 9 p.m. Again, Iowa <coughs> Street, and it would be for Motown downtown. Okay, any discussion? Someone like to make a motion that we close Iowa Street for these two events? I move that we close Iowa Street for uh, these two events. No <laughs> second. All in favor? I hope my voice will hold out tonight. Uh, Apparently, the town hall is the southeastern distributor for what it was going to happen then. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about the uh, banner issue, and uh, I'm opening the uh, item up for discussion. Mr. Hollowfield, sir, welcome. Glad to have you with us. I know I attempted to bring this up last month, and I unfortunately had to be out of town, and I appreciate you putting it on the agenda. Um, some of the concerns that I've heard over the past month are insurance questions and, and dangerous. Um, first off, I'd like to address the insurance question. I think that the insurance that covers the town's hanging baskets and everything else should be more than sufficient to cover a banner across a thoroughfare. Um, next item I'd like to address is the dangerousness of a banner. Most banners are made out of weather, weatherproof mesh. Um, which a lot of towns have that set up in their ordinances and guidelines in order to put up a banner. A banner rolled up in order to ship in a 3 by 25 foot dimension, uh, which I do believe is a little larger than the ordinance that Town Franklin has, which we could look at that later also to do that. But those weigh about four pounds. So that would make them about 13 ounces per square yard of material. So I really don't believe 
um, a hazard on those. Um, and I am talking to some of the aldermen. I do appreciate the fact that you're concerned about the banner being directly at the top of Town Hill, causing distraction from the ingress egress on Main Street. You know, let's entertain putting it at the first crosswalk at Wells Fargo. Yeah, and I'm not asking for a vote or anything tonight. I'm asking that we put this back that we can do some guideline issues so that not-for-profits will be able to put these banners up because it is a very effective way to reach people that wouldn't normally pick up our papers or flyers or things like that and keep us from having to buy expensive ads and things like that. You could buy a generic banner for our annual events that we have. Um, and for an example, Taste of Scotland. Always Father's Day weekend. There's your banner. That's all you're going to see. It's going to be up 30 days before the event, down within three days after. And that's that's kind of the discussion I'm wanting to open up and see if we can do that and maybe put that back to Justin to and set those guidelines up and then it gets, just goes through a, um, a process. <coughs> Joyce did bring up the fact: what if two organizations want to have the same event? Well, you chip in together, you split your event. One's on one end, one's on the other. I mean. There's ways around things without just basically saying no. Mm -hmm. So, and that's basically what I wanted to say about the banners for advertising our community and our town events. Okay. Don't go away yet. Uh, I'm sure there might be some questions. Uh, uh, Councilor, I think you wanted to address the issue just a little bit. Yes, Mr. Mayor, just to sort of review for the board what the nature of the regulation we have on banners is. All of you probably recall when this was a question four or five years ago and, and uh, came up in a manner in which the land use administrator at the time checked the sign ordinance and said, yep, banners are allowed and they're in there and they're regulated and good to go. And he did that without realizing there was also authority, and this is the other kind of authority you have to, to regulate this kind of thing, to regulate streets and sidewalks and your streets and sidewalks ordinance is the place where there was a, a feature of that ordinance that banners could be hung across streets but only as approved by the town and not otherwise and there also was some language in Alderman Mashburn and I were talking about how that came to be uh, when the banners were being hung on the power poles and they wanted some changes to the ordinance to, to regulate who did that and when. Uh, but long story short, we struck out the portion of the that ordinance, the streets and sidewalks, that said that it was possible to hang them across the streets, and now it just says no banners hung across streets. Period. So uh, if the board wanted to entertain allowing ordinances, allowing banners under that ordinance again it would be a fairly simple matter of changing that language but i would caution you to be uh you have to be circumspect in in the way that it, the town is involved with the process i don't it, as you also may recall we adopted a policy for this area of the town property that has a banner on it uh, so that we don't have the town deciding and getting into First Amendment issues with deciding who gets to say what on there. Um, so that's sort of the sum total of, of the, the regulation as it's gone up to now. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. About it. John, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Doesn't the sign ordinance also have the stipulation that banners are exempt and that private citizens like Larry Hallfield can't put a banner across Main Street? But an event or a not for profit is allowed to do that, promoting an event. And I think that's in the sign ordinance 155. Point O to one fifty five point ten. Uh, a banners are allowed. Uh, a banner under the sign ordinance is defined as any sign of lightweight fabric or similar material that is mounted to a pole or a building by a frame or ties at one or more edges, not exceeding thirty six square feet. Right. Um, national flags and municipal flags and other official flags are not considered banners. Right. Um, so it does, the sign ordinance permits the hanging banner. Right. What's not allowed is hanging them over streets. Over streets, which is in your sidewalks and, and streets ordinance. Okay. So we could come up with some text language to, to work around that or work through that to set up a guideline. And it's not that you're restricting. 
freedom of speech, you're, tri you're basically only giving a form of advertisement that has been around from 71 to 2013 back. You know, I'm not asking you to, you know, Angel Hospital is going to have pancake breakfast and they're trying to raise a lot for the cancer. <coughs> that type of thing. Main Street programs putting on uh, pumpkin fest. Those are the things we're talking about. And if, if groups of businesses get together, like well, I have 12 to 15 businesses, we're trying to do a little St. Patty's Day thing back down by the Rasco, and we're all getting together and doing that. Not one individual is promoting just themselves or anything. We're all just getting together to have a good time and, and show that we can come together as a community and businesses and put things together. We're not you know, asking for handouts. We're just asking for the ability to do things. And this, this frees us up advertising dollars if we can do that. If I take seven businesses and buy an $80 banner, it costs us $12 a piece and we put it up for 30 days. How many tens of thousands of people do you think drive up and down Main Street? And, and as I said, I'm not asking for a decision or anything else. I'm just saying, can we open this dialogue to get this ball rolling? That don't put it at the top of town hill. I'm fine with that. Put it at the next crosswalk. You're right in the middle of town. You're looking around anyway. It's going to catch your eye. It's not going to distract you. My only point about the town and involvement in, in where our signs can go is that what we struck out, you, here's what the, the ordinance says now. It says, it shall be unlawful to place, construct, or install banner or sign over a street or roadway in the town. Now, it used to say, except that the sign be anchored on both sides of the street or roadway in a manner in place approved by the board of all. Okay. But isn't there, prior to you even <coughs> doing that, DOT has to okay that because it's going across their roadways. And we mm -hmm. picked that one spot and they okayed it and that was... And then the town set the guideline with the type of banner that would kind of cover a lot of that, would it not? Because you want, don't want it willy nilly up and down the streets. You want one centralized location. Once you train the, the person to look up and see that, then that's where they're going to look. They're not going to be looking all over the place looking for stuff and things like that. My point is, I don't want the town to have to have exercise any authority about who can put up a banner and when. It's going to be approval approval on the sign ordinance and that's it what that yeah yeah right. so, so hey, yeah. they don't want to have everybody come to them and say well we want to put up a banner is this is this read okay you know you <coughs> stuff that you put in the ordinance that it's got to be for a special event not for profit or group of organizations or a church group or you know you can't ostracize any of that but i can't come up and say hey i've got a super bowl party in my house and throw my banner up <laughs> Yeah, what time? Yeah, what time? BYOB. And that's all I'm talking about instead of just the finite. This is the easiest thing, so we're not involved. Yes, ma'am. What do you visualize physically putting it up? I know about six different businesses in town that have bucket trucks that you give us the time frame that we can do it. If we have to hire them to put them up, we want the banners up bad enough, and that's what we'll do. We'll get the guidelines from you on exactly how that is. We do not have permission from the building owners right now. I didn't have any reason to get the cart before the horse. Hey, can we hang a banner? Well, the town said we said never mind. That's that's all I'm getting at is just moving forward with this and get the guidelines for what we can do. And not have to come to you every time. Any any questions from the board? Uh, what I, I guess what I'm wondering about is the consensus of the board that we re rethink our current ordinance, work with the folks who are interested in the banner situation, and come up with a plan. Uh, who, what, where, when. Uh, Larry, you only spent 17 years on the planning board, so you kind of look like a, a person that could take this thing and run with it. Uh, uh, and, and pick out some other people. Uh, John, how, how are we about uh, looking at that right now? Uh, yeah, I think that'd be fine. I think that's a good process to follow. Uh, I would just want to see it before, and I don't even know how involved I need to be in it, but I'll We'll make you as involved as you want to be. <laughs> <laughs> You've been a Rotarian before. You can find you a job. Right. Well, I, I'm just looking at it. the audience here. I know we've got a lot of people that are interested in the banners. And it would, uh, you know, the mayor can't appoint you to serve on this committee. So, uh, now, I made you sit through a presentation the other night. What's so, uh, the place of the board? I think it's time that we do reopen the discussion. Okay. Yeah. And let's see if we can find a common meeting ground. 
Right. Mm -hmm. I like I like the idea of just having one place that it would be put on a dog cut and dry and simplifies. Well, it, it's our downtown. It's our main street. We don't want. Well, they didn't let me put mine there. I'm going to go hang it over here. So all of a sudden, we look like Tijuana, Mexico, <laughs> with all the banners. And that's not what we're doing. We want to show community support and get the, the information out. Well, would, would you do this? Would you sign up some folks that would be willing to serve to work out these details? And I'm sure some of the board members uh, would be uh, okay with it. And I know our chief of police would uh, be good to work with you. Now, my question is, do you want this to, present to, this to be worked out to be presented to the planning board? Did the planning board then work with the text and structure on that? And that would be the only involvement that I feel that John would be involved in. And that if it's brought before to request a text change of the sign uh, sidewalk and streets ordinance, or would you come back to this one? I mean, I'm unfamiliar with the process, but I just want to know which I way don't think you're required to take it to the planning board anyway. I mean, because I think that both of those both of those are police power type ordinances. Right. Like that, you know, so it wouldn't have to go to the planning board. No, it, it would not because it has to here. And it certainly could just just be. Um, but that's, I mean, it's a, it's a pleasure to do it. I, I don't think it's a complicated enough issue that and that's we can't that. just have it back here in a month. And okay. Do, do we need to, oh, excuse me, Farrell, I'm sorry. No, just, I, I like that's what we all do is let's start working up some stuff that we can, we can start looking at. And so, and since we're not I having the best point. way to do it, I'm here to show this cover so well. No. Tom Harris is on the board. the chairman of the planning board. He might as well be on this board. Does, does this require a formal vote or can it be just the census of the board? No, sir. I don't think you need to take it. Okay. Is so, that all right with the board? Yeah. So, we've got your work cut out and we're here to help you any way we can, Larry. Thank and you. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, the next item of business is uh, we need to set a public hearing for the rezoning petition for three parcels of land on Silo Road. Uh, Mr. Setzer, I think you'll do the presentation, sir. Yes, uh, in your packet you should see the uh, petition application from the town of Franklin for the three parcels, <coughs> which are currently zoned R1 and MICR, and the request in, the original requesting was C2 and C2SU. Um, since then, we have met with the planning board, and <coughs> on it, in fact, it, you'll see you'll see the aerial and the map of the parcels, the 61 acres. Since then, the planning board has made the, has made the recommendation to have all 61 acres, all three parcels, to re, be rezoned to C2SU. So. With that, if you ask what that's uh, the difference and why they did that, uh, their their view was it would give the board, the governing board, town board, more control over the parcels uh, in the future future development. If you uh, increase your buffers, uh, you know you could require sidewalks, multiple different things that's in our new ordinance right now. Anything that's in our ordinance. So that was the recommendation to make it all and to make it uniform so we're not, you know, breaking it up a little bit. And uh, and you'll see that in my staff report, those changes and when we met and the recommendations and also their finding of facts with their uh, recommendations highlighted in red. All right, so what we're going to need will be a uh, motion to set a public hearing for the rezoning petition uh, on Monday, April the 6th at 7 05. Do I hear a motion for that? I make a motion. Second. All in favor? Is that all that you needed on that one? Yep. Just that motion, okay. All right, the next, uh, Mr. Setzer has a special use permit application to the town planning board. Yes, uh, need your recommendation to send uh, a special use permit onto the plan board for the recommendation and review. Uh, in your package, you'll see an application from uh, <coughs> North Carolina, and uh, they are requesting to have a uh, 
five acre parcel that's on Silo Road uh, go through the special use process for a 60 unit housing development. And being this, that is a requirement on our special use permit to go through the special use process. Justin, is this, is this in the same area that we just <coughs> This is in the same area that we were saying public here at the point. Yes. So we're okay. Is that joining? Well, if we resolve it, then it's inside. Exactly. It's inside the area that's resolved. Okay. This is a neat illustration of the advantage of, a, of a, an SU zone. You know, we're, we're looking at the zone in that whole area to C2 SU for special use, meaning that in that special use zone, there are no uses of right. All of the, they're all, they're permitted uses, and they're all the ones that are in C2 now, but all of them are required to be for a special use process so that the planning board and this board get a really close look at and can place additional conditions on, on that special use permit. Like Justin was saying, if you thought that this, well, say maybe the use is too intense next to a neighborhood and you think it needs a little more buffer, you could require them. No, we're not going to give it to you unless you move this whole thing and give it more of a, you know, a, a forested buffer or something along those lines to give some more uh, space to other adjacent uses. Do we, um, have, do we have sufficient water and sewer out there for our developments along that area? Did I, I throw <coughs> But there was some water. There was some water there. Uh, campus in the library. And and I'm going to ask you also not to. Here here's the problem with special use. Yeah. Also, I have to read you the Riot Act about being involved in or deliberating about this particular one until it's back here. Um, you really don't have any choice but to forward this to the planning board because a property owner has a has a legal right to have this thing heard by which whatever entity decides whether or not they get a special use uh, permit it's a it's like the right to have a have something heard in court um, so be for that same reason you all are going to sit as finders of fact <coughs> when that hearing eventually does happen so i'll remind you all of that fact it means that you really can't go investigate it on your own shouldn't be talking to anybody outside of that hearing about it. Um, just kind of have to wait and reserve judgment based on what you hear in that hearing. And and yes, part of the application, I can tell you generally, part of the special use application is that they have to show that there's sufficient uh, sewer and water utilities. utilities okay. That's the only question I was going to make sure before we move the head on all things. And and the in this process, you have to have a neighborhood compatibility meeting, which is notifying all uh, property owners that are joining or within 400 feet of the property, and we've already held that meeting. Uh, we held that last week, and so that's been met and took care of. We had to have that done before that we could have it sent on. So. Okay. Do we need to set a public hearing or anything on this? Just, this is just for we need a motion to forward the forward <coughs> okay. the special okay. use for All right. Uh, I'll entertain such a motion. No. Second. Okay. All in favor. Okay, Mr. Setzer, you have some updates on the Department of Transportation projects. Yes. Um. Well, when I, I've got a number of things and some projects that DOT is doing on their own, but a little background on some others. When I first come to town, I've been resident in town in town for you know, pretty much all my whole life. Um, I had some places in town that I was like wanted to see some stuff that needs to be fixed, some minor things, nothing major, nothing that was needed going through the NCDOT step program, which you're going to have to find towards funding and, and a rating program, some minor stuff that was just town needed. And uh, so met with some DOT officials, some engineers, and we, we went around and looked at some stuff. And one of the projects that I've been spoke to with district engineer and said that had been fully funded through division funding was down at Depot Street, the intersection depot in East Main, right there at Hot Spot. Many people know, people drive around town, when you get some heavy rain, there's a, always a huge puddle of water there, and it's just, and uh, 
So approach them about putting some drainage in there. And uh, also there's some sidewalk problems, or some sidewalk right there. If you'll notice anybody when they drive through there, they'll see there's a crosswalk, but there's a crosswalk to a <coughs> curb, there's no ramp. There's a pedestal, so obviously it's not handicap accessible, not ADA compliant. So while we are there, we looked at it, and they were, uh, informed me that that has been fully funded and starting in July, that project will be let and should hopefully then be start sometime in the fall to add that drain, to fix that drainage problem right there. That's uh, water coming off Debo Street and fixing the crosswalk area right there where it's, you know, make it look a lot better. You'll see some pedestal and uh, changes and some stuff moving there just to make it look a lot better. Um, second is the Cat Creek project. Now on Cat Creek, a lot of people know there's DOTs have the project where they want to do the turnaround at Cat Creek. Um, it has been awarded and it is tasked to, construction is tasked to start on March 23rd this month. And it can go all the way through uh, October the 30th. That's the time frame that the contractor has to start and finish. Um, third is there are some repaving that's going to come up in the next year that has been funded. Uh, Lakeside Drive is going to be full, repaved all the way through. Uh, Walmart Street is going to be repaved all the way through. And Daddle Mountain, at the beginning of Daddle Mountain right there at Wells Grove, going up towards the new Walmart, there's a section there where it's old pavement and then there's a new pavement start. That section is going to be repaved. And that is been awarded in is to start April the 1st of this year and has to be completed by June the 30th. Um, and the fourth one is, well this is this could change, but it hasn't it hasn't went to a bid yet, but DOT bids before me that Highlands Road, East Palmer, and Northeast Main is scheduled to be repaved in 2015 or is the, the fall of uh, this year as well. They're going to, it's going to be let in July with paving to start somewhere potentially in the fall. Sometimes these things they could get pushed back. It's not a done deal yet. But those areas will be milled and lowered, not just a repave like we did on uh, West Main this past year, this 2013. So that's my DOT updates that I have for the coming year. Any questions, Mr. Setzer, for the board? Well, there's been some of those streets a lot of people have been very upset with. I'm glad to see they're going <coughs> to take care of them. Barbara, did you get some? No, I'm just really happy, especially about the Depot Street crossing the areas. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yeah. Setzer, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Did that take care of all of you? That, that's all of us. Okay. The yeah. next one. Pardon? I'm going to stick around for summer. She's up. No, oh, okay. Uh, Madam Manager, you got to bring us up to date on the town bridge. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor and Town Board. Uh, Mr. Setzer and I received a phone conference with officials from NCDOT in regards to the town bridge proposal. I've distributed um, at each of your desks. There's two things just to start considering. The first photo, and there's photos available for the news media. Uh, just get a copy for you guys leave. The first photo is what they're referring to as a stacked. Am I correct? Yeah, stack. It's a stacked brick flow. Mm -hmm. And then the second photo is more of a simulated rock flow. So something to start considering the next couple months is DOT is going to want the town board to consider which style you prefer. Um, and also, they're supposed to be getting to us sometime soon a color palette because the town board will also need to choose the color palette for this. So just kind of an update, something to start pondering and considering. Okay. Uh, we'll make some more copies of this, maybe put it on the bulletin board so anyone that's interested in seeing them, uh, somebody can have my copy after the meeting. Anything else, Madam Manager, on the yes. bridge? Okay. All right, the next item is a reappointment of uh, Ms. Presley, Candy Presley, to the Tourism Development Authority. Uh, Madam Manager. Uh, 
Yes, Mr. Mayor, town board. The next item that we have is the reappointment of Candy Presley. Uh, the TDA board voted unanimously at their February 9th meeting to recommend the reappointment of Candy Presley as chairman of the Tourism Development Authority Board for a three-year term, which would start March the 2nd, 2015, and end March of 2018. Okay, you need a motion on that. Yes. Do I hear a motion to uh, reappoint Ms. Presley? Yes. All in favor. All right, uh, Madam Manager, you're going to give us the uh, town budget schedule. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, down board. What you have before you in your agenda packet is a proposed budget calendar for this fiscal, for the upcoming fiscal year 2015-2016. Um, what we have lined out just as a proposal, March 20th would be budget detail presented to department heads. April 10th would be department head budget submitted to the manager's office. April 14th through the 17th would be budget review with departments. <coughs> May the 4th, we'd like to present the proposed budget to the town board. And then May 16th would be a proposed work session with the town board. We allotted for some room in there in case you guys needed two work sessions. There would be ample time between after your May 16th meeting to your June 1st meeting when we would need to have the public hearing and possible adoption of the 2015-2016 budget. Good. And if I might editorialize just a little bit on that, uh, we hope some members of the public will come and see the type of things that we wrestle with, the different pots of money we have, and the ones that need more, and the one that needs less, and, and how we go about uh, setting the budget. Uh, you'd be, be more than welcome to come. All right, do we need a, uh, I need a motion to set the fiscal year of 2015 and 2016. Second. All right, all in favor. I guess I got that right. Yeah, okay. All right, we have a resolution to appoint town manager, uh, Ms. Woodard, to the Tourism Development Authority Board. Uh, Councilman, you will present this. Mr. Mayor, uh, the town board is the appointing authority for the PDA. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, the town manager was appointed uh, to be a sitting member of that board. The purpose of bringing this back to you tonight is I think that the intent of the town at the time was to make a sort of an ex officio appointment to that board to be more or less permanent, to say whoever our manager is, we find it's best for the administration of the, the room occupant, occupancy tax that, that our manager sit on that board. And so that's what this resolution does. Um, just to clarify what the intent of the, of the town is and was as regarding the management of the TEA. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about that. John, do I also understand if, if for some reason the manager is out of town or is sick or something, she can appoint somebody else to take her place for that meeting? Yes, That's correct. And that is in, that is in, uh, comports with what the original appointment also was. It was the town manager and or designee. And I think it's fairly common to have a, a town manager is, is appointed to something that they can designate somebody to go in their place. Has she also served as the secretary to that board? Well, and we, I think we do need to <coughs> clarify with the TDA. We may need to ask the TDA to, to look at some <coughs> bylaws amendments that recognize this, this appointment and bring it into line with that. Okay, uh, you have a uh, motion or uh, council? It would just be to adopt the resolution. Okay. All right. Do I hear a motion to adopt the resolution? Make a motion. Just a second. All in favor. <laughs> Councilor, uh, you're back up uh, on a annexation policy. Mr. Mayor, uh, as the board is, uh, remembers from the Last month's regular meeting, we looked at the proposed annexation of the Henry T. property, uh, 441 South. Um, and working with Mr. Simons, we found that uh, it did not meet the uh, annexation requirements for a satellite annexation. 
I'm not clear if I ever got the board a clear answer on there was some question of well this abuts another satellite does that really make it a satellite itself or is it maybe you know maybe it doesn't have to meet all the standards of a satellite annexation because it touches another one the answer to that is it's still a satellite annexation and it still does have to meet all of these requirements <coughs> among the requirements that a satellite annexation <coughs> has to meet before it, you can even consider uh, annexing into the town uh, was one that can't be part of a subdivision and really that's that was the end of our inquiry because this really was and is part of a subdivision um, and what's required under annexation law uh, for a satellite annexation is if it's part of a subdivision the entire subdivision has to um, petition to be annexed in or you can't take any <coughs> It bothers me that that, it, I don't think that this is the kind of situation that that law was written to try to handle. I think it was meant to try to keep half of Mill Creek Estates from being part of the town and the other half not. It was, you know, true residential subdivisions that are run as residential subdivisions. I don't think that's been the case of that one for a long time. It's got the Georgia Road to the middle of it. It's commercial on each side of the street to, to some extent. So. I think it's unfortunate there's not any recognition of that in state law, but there is, and as things stand, we really just cannot consider annexation of that property without a change in the law. Uh, so what has been proposed is, um, and the General Assembly does this all the time with particularly this area of law and lots of other ones, but there are, there are local acts that, that relax given certain requirements. Um, in this case, uh, so what I brought you, you basically have three choices if you want to consider this annexation. One, you can, you can do nothing. I'm not telling you you have to. As I told you last month, this is a voluntary annexation. It's voluntarily offered by the owner of the property. It's got to be voluntarily accepted by the town. Uh, I don't find any law that says, I can't find any case of a municipality in North Carolina being forced to take an annexation. It just doesn't work that way. But if you are interested in considering taking it uh, into the town limits, then the, your next two options, and I've sent you two sets of documents that do each of these things. One, ask the General Assembly, and Senator Davis, I understand, is ready to uh, take this and submit it. I need to get it to them immediately because we're right at the, the submission deadline. Um, for consideration of this is your session. Um, we can ask the General Assembly to relax just the subdivision requirement for satellite annexations. Uh, they did this not long well, this last session for the village of Foxfire. Uh, they relaxed the subdivision requirement only. And that was the only thing they did in that particular case. Um, that will allow you to consider annexation of just this one property or any others in the future that happen to be part of an old subdivision. Now, I think there's a big advantage to that because if you're looking at future annexations down the Georgia Road, we know that this subdivision is a problem down here. And there, it's dotted with commercial uses of property that may well want to annex in eventually. And we'll have the same problem if we don't get some relief from that subdivision uh, language. Uh, the third option that, that you have before you is, and I have also brought you a resolution to that effect and um, a proposed local, local legislation to relax both the subdivision requirement and the 10% requirement. Another one of the standards for a satellite annexation is the area you bring in total for all your satellites in, of the town cannot exceed 10% of your original corporate limit. Not original, your, your current corporate limit. And that means the contiguous, the current contiguous area. Uh, I have no idea where we stand on that. I know that when we, Justin, when we looked at, we looked at how much area this meant, and we weren't close to the 10%, but nowhere near, probably maybe 1%. And I think a lot of that is because the last round of involuntary annexation we did did away with a lot of satellites by getting to them from the from the corporate boundary. Um, 
but I would, my advice would be if you're interested in future dairy annexation doesn't, effectively doesn't exist anymore. Um, asking the General Assembly now to relax both the subdivision regulation and the 10% requirement, and that's very common. If you look at the, the proposed legislation I did to do that, it's like 30 municipalities, including public by Waynesville, uh, has, has done that. Uh, have asked the General Assembly to relax the requirements, including that, that 10%. Uh, and it just effectively repeal as to whatever town is <coughs> added to it. So if you did that option, you would potentially be looking at a lot more future requests to, to annex in. But I think that would be wise to do. Um, and I think if you take that option, you also should consider, uh, we need to look at the voluntary annexation policy again. Um, those of you who were on the board when uh, there was a prior satellite annexation request that the board felt like they, were, they just didn't want to consider it. So we changed that policy and said, if we're talking about properties that are outside the town and the ETJ limits, then we're just not interested. I think it'd be a good time to, to maybe get a retreat, and all the Mashroom was saying this earlier, would be a good topic for a retreat to have the town board consider what your priorities really look like for, for voluntary organizations. So uh, just to sum up, the three options that you have before you are either do absolutely nothing with this or request, uh, by adoption of this resolution, request relaxation of the subdivision regulation or both subdivision regulation and the 10% area. Standard. John, how would this affect uh, the rest of the people in the subdivision that may not want to do this? Um, yeah, I'll speak to that. <coughs> yes, Mr. <Ms>. Fowler. <coughs> Mr. Mayor and members of the board, I'm Steve Fowler. I represent Mr. T and the other petitioners on this property. Uh, to bring you up to date on that specific question. I would point out, first of all, that the board either intentionally or inadvertently has already accepted that there is no subdivision any longer. Because when the board annexed the property across the highway, which is the Mexican restaurant property on the Georgia Road, you took property that was in Longview subdivision. Uh, but I think in doing that, you recognize that it no longer had the characteristics of a subdivision. If you read the statute of what a subdivision is, it's basically anything that's been divided into two or more sections for sale. And that fits virtually anything that was ever Somebody buys 10 acres of property and cuts it in two and sells two five-acre parcels. That's a subdivision under the statute. But as far as the other people are, con are concerned, since the last meeting, I drafted a petition to do three things. Uh, the petition for everyone else in the subdivision to support the petition for annexation. Uh, a, basically a statement from all of those people that there is no longer a subdivision and there is a street within what was the subdivision that has actually been moved and an agreement that the, where it's been moved will be the street. It covers three things. Uh, we have secured the signatures of everybody in the subdivision with the exception of two landowners. I understand one of those is deceased and we haven't found the heirs yet, and the other is an, uh, an absentee owner that's in Florida. We simply have not gotten that, but we have all of the others. All of the, the property that is seeking annexation is in the north of that property, and we have the people in the subdivision, or I keep using what used to be the subdivision, uh, that have signed that and we'll be able to get the other two. The uh, other thing that I would mention after the meeting last uh, month, uh, 
Senator Davis contacted some of the people involved and said, well, if I can <coughs> pass a resolution in the legislature to get this uh, annexed, private resolution. But uh, we said, well, let's, let's get what we're going to do and go to the board with that, get their approval for that and because every once in a while people complain about government, you know, and we thought, well, this will eliminate one of those complaints. Uh, so we basically have the approval of virtually everyone in there. The uh, nature of the subject is uh, there were restrictive covenants in the subdivision. They ran out 25 years ago in uh, 1988. So the property now is unrestricted. There is no restriction on who can do what with it. Um, the property has changed because when US 441-23 was widened, it took a good portion of this section of the, uh, what was this, Longview subdivision. And there's only one primary residence left in this area. Every other dwelling that's in there, which are two or three, are owned by absentee landlords and rented out. Uh, so it's basically become commercial. And like I said, the property across the highway, which was also part of Longview subdivision, has already been annexed by the town. So you wouldn't, in approving this, you wouldn't be doing anything that's different than what you done when they were annexed several years ago. Because the statutes were the same. If you if this were a subdivision, still a subdivision, you're supposed to annex the whole thing. But uh, it wasn't a subdivision at that time. Any questions of Mr. Fowler? Well, I'm all for, for requesting the, the uh, local legislation. I'm just not too sure about this 10%. Does anybody have any comments on that? Maybe you can understand that a little bit better. You mean as to what the requirement is? Well, yeah, I understood the 10%. It, you can't see the 10% of what the, what the local is. But is there any negatives in that? If we also have that removed? I think the idea of that requirement is to try to, to not, not let a municipality overextend itself I guess and you know try to take in more satellite area than it can possibly really hope to service effect <coughs> um, well, that's I, still to be controlled because there's no longer <coughs> annexation and now it's, there's only voluntary annexation right. so the board still controls what they allow to be voluntary annexed right. and surely they can Watch for that and yes. if yeah. extend in the, yeah. the, the power to do something yeah. else. And who else but the, but the board and the town knows what, you know, we can't overextend ourselves if we don't have the bell building of the utilities that we supply that area. And I think that's part of, I mean, it's what's in your current vol uh, voluntary annexation policy. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing needs to be in there to shape and guide your decisions. Do we, you know, there may be, it may even be a good idea to adopt sort of a point system that says, well, you already got water and sewer that services this property <coughs> for, for the possibility of, of accepting that annexation. Um, and to, to all the to answer your question, I feel like um, it is a result of growth in any municipality you can go into that you will see where there had been residential uses that became commercial over time. And that's already happening down there. And it doesn't, I don't know that we, you know, I think that if you consider annexation down in through that whole area, you'll only be recognizing it's already an ongoing reality. So, well, we're already seeing the, you know, the, the bypass around Franklin. We're already seeing the continuous development there. And I think that uh, 441 South is going to be our next area that we're going to see commercial development in that area. Okay, any further questions? Mr. Fowler, Mr. Henney? All right, um, 
So basically what we'll do now is take a motion to refer this to Senator Davis for a local bill. And I, need, black. I need to know which one. All right, what's the pleasure of the board? <coughs> the vote on it. Motion for uh, local legislation uh, and the removal of the 10%. 10% and the uh, subdivision. Subdivision, yeah. Okay. Local legislation for subdivision and the removal of the 10%. I'll make it motion. Okay. Uh, there's no interest in the other motion. Okay. All in favor? Thank you. Ms. Appreciate it, sir. Okay. We have a uh, Department of Transportation deed of uh, highway right of way. Uh, Mr. Uh, Councilor. Um, Mr. Mayor, the board members all have in front of you a rather large uh, plat. <coughs> Basically what has been requested and to try to orient you as to where this is, this is you know, east down Main Street. Um, and then, you know, so this is the replacement of Town Bridge so that the large, darker area you're looking at there is what will be the Town Bridge replacement. As a part of that, the Department of Transportation has asked for, uh, well, they've asked to buy, they've offered to buy, the green area that you see there inside that red box. And that red box is a little tract of land owned by the town that has a pump station and a pump house on it. Although I understand the pump house is sort of a pump lead to it. It's, uh, it's going to fall over and then we'll be. At any rate, um, so they have asked, they have made an offer to buy for 1300 and some odd dollars that green triangle there, uh, just for their easement purposes. We have done, we have a <coughs> deed that will do that. Uh, it is a resolution that accepts that as, as adequate consideration. Our suggestion, though, is to table that matter for the night and let uh, the town manager and I go back to the, the DOT. I, what we want much better for the town is relocating all of this. Now, if they need some of it, I don't know why all of it wouldn't, wouldn't work just as well for them. And I understand that there is going to be some DOT taking of, of the rest of this property. See if they won't just exchange for us straight up. You can have that whole area if we can have a different one that's part of this that will suit the location of the pump station better. <coughs> and we'll look into moving that as well. So that's that's our recommendation to you there. Pretty much good. Yeah, and I we <coughs> the council and I spoke with public works director Jay Gibson and let him look at that as well. And his recommendation is that department head would he felt that would be in the best interest if we could move forward. <coughs> Okay, so you're just going to, uh, we're just going to put that to the next month. Do yes. we need a motion to do that? Information? No. Take action. Right. Okay, minimum housing code violation at 14 Brittany Lane. Council? Mr. Mayor, uh, I think that all the board members are familiar with this process. I can't remember. <laughs> This, this is an action under the Minimum Housing Code to uh, force that, that's right, um, to compel uh, compliance with the Minimum Housing Code. Um, essentially, when you have, when your land use administrator goes through the process of not notifying somebody that they are out of compliance with the Minimum Housing, he has to give them an opportunity to be heard, and then if he, find, he finds it to be dilapidated, it gives them an order to have it removed and demolished within 90 days, uh, or you have two options. You can either start a lawsuit against them to compel the, the people who own it to fix it, to comply with the order, or you can have <coughs> the property. But that second option is fairly risky and not something we want to prefer to do. So the uh, resolution before you on this matter is to instruct me as town attorney to go pursue uh, a court order against the owners of this property and Justin's got some pictures just to show you yeah, this. Um, I've got a little timeline. This was complaint 
driven. All these minimum houses <coughs> that I do is complaint driven. I don't know about trying to find these because it's a long drawn out process. But also after some flights come in, I did an inspection back in on July the 30th last year. I did a side inspection and uh, went out this home, you may know Brittany Lane is, Brittany Lane is off of uh, Gaston Street. And this home back, I think it was around 2010, it had a fire. Yeah. And uh, since after the fire, it's just left the home completely unlivable. And when I went out back in July, these pictures are from them. I don't have any recent ones. There's really not even much depth change in it. This is what I saw that day when I went out. You can see it just, it was just about covered up with uh, ivy and the kudzu. Uh, this is a side view of the lot, which there's people that live just right behind this. And next you can see uh, this is looking in the back door. There's no front door, there's no windows back door. You can see where the furniture and the ceiling's gone from from the fire. There's actually on this the front door right here, which there's if there's no floor. So if you walk in the front door you're going in the back. So um, and with anybody can go in there. It could be children, it could be you know squad or anybody. Um, there's a little view of it. You can see a little bit more of the block going out of the basement and then with actually stuff growing and uh, in, the, in the, what looked like to be the original living room. Uh, it's exposed to the weather. There's a vent hole for the fire department vent in the roof that's been exposed since 2010. So we're just about now close to getting there five years of rain and the weather going in there. Um, that's what the kitchen looks like. And you know, obviously it's rotten, just deteriorating. And then this is the outside on the back side that I could get to, and you can see it's just completely exposed to the elements for animals and rodents and insects. So they can just go right in the house as well, and obviously, you know, it's starting to rot as well. Um, so went back on July the 30th, did a site visit. Uh, Sent my first violation letter on August the 1st to the <coughs> 13 heirs of the property, <laughs> which is only one that we're making count. Um, had a hearing on sep September the 30th with the administrator, the estate administrator. That was being, Mr. Henning, that was part of the easiest for me to do because she, she lived in town. Most of these, they lived everywhere from Tennessee, Asheville, Labard, Washington, D.C., Maryland. They were all over. And uh, so I met with her so she could then, in a sense, inform the owners as well of what we met with. After that, sent the termination letter of the findings and cents, which should be in your packet, uh, determined you know, the house that just needs to be removed or demolished. And that was sent on October the 6th to all of the heirs. And then went from that, they have 90 days to comply. So that 90 days was then was going to be up from, <coughs> I went by the, we have to send certified return receipt notification all these. Uh, so I went by the latest return receipt that I got from one of the heirs when it's verifying that they got a receipt for that 90 days, which would have put it at January the 21st. <coughs> and just on, because I didn't have no one called, no one sent on just good nature, I talked to the administrator for the state. <coughs> didn't have to do this, but got the phone numbers of all the heirs and called, called, tried to call most of them. Some I got, you know, a bad number, you know, or disconnected, talked to about five or six, or left a message with them. And I did that back on the 12th of January. So now, since nothing's happened, still sitting the same, haven't heard anything from them since that conversation, any of those letters, that's why I've come for you tonight. Okay, Mr. Henning, you have a motion that we should address just about the resolution and to pursue the Enforcement of the own housing code. Anybody want to discuss it any further? 
I'll entertain the motion then. Okay, I have a second. Second. All in favor. It takes care of that. All right. We've been quite successful, but it was Yes. Well, it looks to me like we've got a real public safety issue there. If a child or a pet should wander into that house, they're going to be in the basement. We've got, we've got several areas in, in, in the limits that are just like that. The only problem is, is the reluctance from the neighbors. The uh, town hall office will be closed Friday, April the 3rd, in observance of Good Friday. Let's run around the table real quick. Joyce, do you have anything you want to No, I up? think it's been a real positive meeting. I'm real pleased with it. Thank you. Mr. Jameson? No. Mr. Nashburn? No. Ms. Abel? Okay. Ms. McRae? No. Earl? No. Well, if y'all know, not on either. Yeah, sure. Sure. Actually, I, I actually, oh, maybe a little late. Uh, go ahead, sir. Well, I just want to clarify, and this is from the town manager. I should have, should have clarified when we talked about the annexation issue. I just don't want the board or the media to be the one to leave with the impression that the action that the, the general assembly will take will finalize this. Mr. Filo talked about a, a personal, a, a, a private bill that would have made them a, a annexed into the town. We're not pursuing that particular avenue. Uh, they will still have to be qualified through the, the process, but now uh, the town clerk can certify that they do meet the, as soon as this bill passes, they'll be able to certify that they do meet the annexation requirement. So we're still looking at, then you'd have to have a public hearing and vote on it, um, which, you know, so we've got a little bit of time left before this will be finished. But we, it was important for the town to take this approach to it to address some of the other, you know, the general questions about satellite annexation and, and what it's going to look like moving forward. Thank you. Any other questions for the standing council? Now, manager, you have anything there? No, Mr. Mayor. Being known for the business, I'll adjourn and we'll be back in uh, April. Adjourn. Oh. Okay.